Bună seara și bine ați venit la noi! Avem onoare, am onoarea ca să o prezint pe doamna Alexandra Iremia și doar atât ai spus să se prezinte singură, pentru că are atâtea titluri, atâtea ocupații și că o, sunt sigur că o să rămâneți încântat de ceea ce o să vă spună. E uh, o acțiune care la noi, la Sfânt Nicolau, nu s-a mai făcut de genul ăsta. Îți doresc spor la treabă. Uh, bună seara! Eu sunt de meserie, meseria principală între atâtea titulaturi pe care vorbește Bunul Mândran este cea de ghid de turism, de pentru care eu îmi câștig pâinea pe stradă, vorbim cu toți gomotul ăla din Timișoara uh, în fundal și acopăr de obicei 10 de persoane. De aceea întrebam pentru că vocea mă duce, dar uh, cu microfonul stă mai, uh, mai greu. Uh, mă bucur foarte tare că am avut ocazia să replicăm acest eveniment uh, la Sinicola, unde de fapt este la el acasă. O primă vizionare a filmului pe care urmează să-l vedeți în această seară a avut loc în luna noiembrie anului 2019 la Timișoara, în cadrul unor serii de serii, de seri bănățene sau seri ale patrimoniului organizate de Direcția Județeană de Cultură. Filmul a fost foarte bine primit la momentul respectiv și dragii mei colaboratori din această sală, familia Mândran, respectiv Adriana Luchin, Uh, au văzut acest, uh, acest eveniment și au zis, ok, ar fi cel mai potrivit să-l facem la Sinicolau. Trebuia să se întâmple acum ceva vreme, dar uh, pandemia a fost potrivnică. Uh, astfel încât, iată-ne aici, după 2 ani și ceva, uh, într-o nouă încercare și uh, reușită de data asta, uh, de a viziona acest film împreună. Uh, cum am ajuns eu, cine sunt eu, de fapt, și cum am ajuns în posesia uh, acestui film, să spunem? Uh, eu am, uh, locuiesc în Timișoara, sunt ghid de turism din 2011, practic Meseria pe care o practic este cea de a merge pe stradă cu turiști, turiști la ei acasă, de cele mai multe ori, pentru că lucrez mult cu localnici, uh, și prezint Mișoara uh, atracțiile turistice, multă istorie, multă poveste. Astfel am fost uh, găsită undeva prin 2013 de către, um, inițial le-am zis, turiști americani. Sunt de fapt, uh, eu le, le spun guests, da? cum ar veni la mine acasă, da? goștii mei, Uh, sunt uh, ei, aceștia fiind descendenții bănăsenilor plecați uh, din această zonă, deci plecați din, uh, de acasă de la ei, în urmă cu 100 sau peste 100 de ani. La început nu am avut de-a face cu descendenți uh, ai, uh, ai românilor, am început cu descendenții jvabilor, au fost primii care s-au arătat, uh, arătat interesați. Uh, și asta pe, pe fondul uh, unei nevoi lăuntrice, personale foarte puternice de a-și redescoperi rădăcinile. Știu că încă în România, respectiv în Banat, deși în Banat, în Banat este mai cunoscută această inițiativă, încă n-am ajuns, să spunem, la așa o, o dorință puternică noi, omul de rând, să ne tot să ne punem să scormonim în arhive, să ne facem arbor genealogii, să ne descoperim stră, stră bunicii, dar, în schimb, în străinătate, pentru cei care au plecat, pentru descendenții Titanicului, cum le zic eu, cei care au plecat acum peste 100 de ani, nevoia aceasta este foarte, foarte puternică, drept pentru care în ultimii, aș spune, chiar 30 de ani, dacă nu mai bine, pentru că unii au început chiar pe vremea comuniștilor, nepoții, strănepoții celor plecați au dorit să-și redescopere rădăcinile, ce au putut să ia de la bunici, de la străbunici sau de la părinților a fost bine luat, dar de cele mai multe ori informația a fost foarte puțină. Nu știau cum se numeau precursorilor, uneori nici măcar bunicii, nu le era clar, erau foarte multe uh, legende în familie uh, legate de ceea ce s-ar fi întâmplat, de unde veneau, nici măcar unii dintre ei nu știau care era localitatea unde se născuseră uh, strămoșilor, de unde se trag ei exact. Deci nevoia asta, vorbim despre oameni care, deși mai poartă nume de familie românești, nu vorbesc, nu vorbesc o iotă de limba română, uh, ceea ce este foarte interesant, la fel se întâmplă și în cazul nemților și în cazul maghiarilor plecați, dar numele lor de familie uh, au o rezonanță clar bănățenească sau etnică uh, din țara veche de origine, însă uh, ei nu mai vorbesc niciun, niciun pic din limbile respective. Toți se plâng că atunci când străbunicii sau bunicilor uh, au ajuns în America sau Canada sau Argentina, uh, ce s-a întâmplat a fost că aceștia au mai vorbit limba de acasă în așa fel încât nepoții să nu înțeleagă. 
Adică doar când aveau secrete de ținut. Da? Sau să nu înțeleagă copiii, să nu înțeleagă nepoții, numai atunci vorbeau nemțește, numai atunci vorbeau românește sau maghiară, de pentru care limba n-a mers mai departe, singurul lucru care a mers au fost, v-am spus, câteva povești de familie, respectiv bucătăria. Și atunci să vedeți, acești oameni care apar uh, în ultimii zeci de ani, vin în România și vor sarmale, vor langoș, vor gulaș, vor uh, șpețle, vor tot ce au moștenit ei sau ce au trăit, ce au gustat în casele părinților, uh, bunicilor și străbunicilor lor, lor pe care i-au, i-au îndrăgit foarte tare și de aici pornind, revin în zona banatului, încercând să ajungă acasă. E acasă, cum, se, cum am început toată povestea, am fost contactat acum în urmă cu mulți ani de zile. Uh, inițial nici nu știau că ar exista cineva care se ocupe de, de acest, uh, această reîntoarcere, să spunem, deși pentru ei era prima dată în zona asta. Uh, și doar aveam nevoie de un interpret, un traducător și un șofer. Uneori mergeau cu un, cu un taximetrist doar până în localitatea respectivă. E, au văzut că se poate mai mult și în momentul în care cineva vine acasă, felul în care se desfășoară o astfel de vizită este uh, luând, de exemplu, așa am început, da? la o legătura cu mine pe mail, eu fiind ghid la momentul respectiv, nu, nu cercetător genealogic și mai departe, și... Uh, din momentul respectiv se anunțau, aș dori să văd, știu informația respectivă. E și de acolo pornește totul, iar în momentul în care oamenii într-un final ajungeau în teritoriu, ceea ce făceam era să mergem în localitatea X, să încercăm să găsim casa familiei, să mergem în cimitir, să vizităm uh, mormintele, măcar de multe ori, măcar să pune piciorul uh, în acel cimitir unde știau că cineva era îngropat din familie, chiar dacă monumentul uh, funerar în sine nu se mai păstra în picioare. Deschidem biserica, se lua un pic de pământ din fața casei, se punea într-un recipient, deci tot felul de manifestări din acestea foarte emoționante, lumea mai plânge când se întâmplă lucrurile astea. Și așa, așa, așa a fost începutul, destul de timid, cumva pur și simplu ca turiștii, hai să mergem să vedem ce e în localitatea respectivă. Era ulterior, toată treaba a devenit mult mai, mai interesantă în momentul în care oamenii nu s-au mulțumit doar cu atât și au dorit să-și facă arbori de familie, să meargă cât mai mult în spate. Și atunci am, intrat, am învățat încet, încet meseria de genealog, de cercetător genealogic, prin care am început să umblu în registre, registrele bisericești, registrele de stare civilă și am săpat și am săpat și am reușit pe unii să-i duc pe spate până la începutul anilor 1800 sau chiar la jumătatea anilor 1700 când au fost colonizați um, în zonă um, nemții, de exemplu, Jvabi și mai departe. Uh, ei bine, cele două cumva au, au căpătat o intensitate tot mai mare și pe măsură ce au trecut ani. Oamenii au văzut că se poate, au recomandat mai departe altora, pentru că pentru ei eram estul Europei, adică nici nu știau dacă au să aibă curajul să vină până aici, dar au început să vină și astfel în 2016, în toamna lui 2016, am primit o vizită din partea a patru doamne care se trag din, din români. Doamnele, la momentul respectiv, președintă, vicepreședintă, trezorierul și membrii ai Societății Române de Genealogie din Minnesota. Aceste doamne au dorit să fie, cum ar deschidă porțile, să fie deschizătoarele de, de drum pentru ceilalți membri și întâmplarea face că aceste doamne au originile exact în Sân Nicolau, la Igriș, la Beba Veche și la Vulcani. A, și Cenar, așa. E, și atunci, în 2016, de acolo s-a pornit o adevărată uh, aventură cu aceste doamne care au venit nu odată, unele dintre ele au venit deja de trei ori și ar fi, ar fi venit în continuare uh, acasă dacă n-ar fi intervenit pandemia, iar unele urmează să revină în, uh, în toamnă. Pe lângă ele am mai avut și alte, uh, și alte situații, alte cazuri, uh, unde, bineînțeles, totul, nu s-a oprit totul, hai să vorbim despre ce a fost, ci pentru mulți dintre bănățenii care uh, au revenit, să spunem, acasă, am reușit puțin mai mult și anume am reușit să-i, să-i facem să se reunească cu familia. Cu verișorii de-al doilea, de-al treilea, deci unde chiar apropiate de fapt, dar despărțite de ocean și de, de această depărtare. Mă bucur foarte tare că în această, sală, în această seară, în această sală, se află chiar persoane care s-au regăsit cu rudele lor chiar în ultimii trei ani de zile. La pe unii am cunoscut chiar eu, dar am înțeles că mai sunt și alte, și alte cazuri. E bine, eu sunt extrem de mulțumită din punctul ăsta de vedere că familiile s-au reunit, că țin legătura. Internetul, într-adevăr, ajută foarte mult. 
și, și lucrurile acestea devin din ce în ce mai actuale, ceea ce face ca în această seară să putem să aibă o logică, să aibă sens acest demers de a vedea un documentar. Documentarul a fost, a fost făcut, în multe detalii, probabil că o să, o să vorbim despre după, practic după proiecție, când o să avem un invitat special de peste, de peste ocean, persoanele care s-au ocupat de acest film, care l-au, care l-au creat, însă, pentru că v-am le menționat pe cele patru doamne de la The Romanian Genealogy Society din Minnesota, Filmul le aparține, creierul din spate este doamna Vicky Albu, care are origini în, în Sfânt Nicolau și pe care o să avem bucuria să o vedem puțin, puțin mai târziu live. Deși am zis totuși, nu știu exact cum stăm cu timpul, pentru că eu m-aș putea întinde mult și bine, dar, dar, dar mă gândeam să vă spun niște, să vă povestesc unul, două cazuri. Uh, mai, uh, mai interesante și mai puțin aștept, așteptate, să spunem, de către, de către multă lume. Știți, oamenii, la un moment dat, când ajungi la un perete din ăsta, de brick wall, cum îi zic ei, peretele de cărămide, dincolo de care nu mai poți să sap, pentru că, cel puțin, până dai de un cercetător în genealogie, ești în Statele Unite, nu știi cum să ajungi mai departe și ce faci? Îți faci teste de ADN. Iar aceste teste de ADN stau la baza, închipuiți-vă, da? o doamnă din Statele Unite ale Americii își face un test de ADN și întâmplarea face că la Sara Vale, un alt tânăr, dar de vârsta mea un prieten, asta e coincidența, dar își face și el un test de ADN. E, și să regăsesc cei doi ca verișori. Bine, aici probabil că gradul e diferit, pentru că e diferență mare de vârstă între ei, vorbim de vreo 40 de ani de diferență aproape, nu, cu 30. Așa? E, și se pun să se regăsesc, se caută, să apă în comun până când ajung ca uh, liniile lor familiale să se, uh, să se întretaie. Doar că, uh, bineînțeles, este o bucurie să-ți găsești, uh, uh, să-ți găsești rudele pe această cale cu testul de ADN și devine și la noi din ce în ce mai la modă. Există, dacă se dăși cu după aceea, după proiecția filmului, mă puteți întreba și vă spun cum vă puteți face în acest în asemenea test. Nu e atât de greu și nu e nici foarte, foarte scump. Um, se mai întâmplă, în schimb, și situații în care uh, sunt, uh, de exemplu, doi verișori, uh, își fac amândoi, adică cresc împreună, sunt crescuți de același bunic, un bunic care îi adoră pe ambii verișori, uh, ei se consideră membrii aceleiași familii și undeva pe la 60 și ceva de ani, între bără, verișorii, am, sau respectiv ambele familii își fac un test de ADN, ghiciți ce descoperă, uh, unul dintre verișori nu era fiul tatălui lui. În schimb, ce îți mai arată un test de ADN? Testul de ADN îți arată uh, rudele. Și se trezește domnul respectiv cu vreo sută de frați. Și zice, opa, ce se întâmplă? Da, ce credeți că a fost în spate? Asta, eu n-aș fi veci pururi, nu mi-aș fi închipuit că exista așa ceva prin anii 40 în Statele Unite. Un bănățean de-al nostru, potent, așa, uh, era, nu știu dacă îți cuvintele, dar, cum i-am spune, pe orașul comunal sau... <laughs> da? Avea și el o afacere în Statele Unite și asta era inseminarea uh, familiilor tot de români, în mare parte, care nu puteau să aibă copii. <coughs> și uite așa, ne-am trezit <laughs> cu uh, testele ADN ce poate să-ți mai arate. Uh, întâmplarea face că domnii respectivi oricum se consideră în continuare verișori, bunicul este bunic pentru că el i-a crescut, au revenit în banat, și am, făcut, am săpat pe calea bunicului respectiv, deși, bineînțeles, din toate se trezești cu un cosută de frați, cumva îți dă un proiect nou de viață la 60-70 de ani, pentru că trebuie să-i vezi și pe ceilalți, nu? Și cazul, cazul cel mai vechi, mă rog, care mă duce cel mai mult în spate, și aici mă mai prezint încă un lucru pe care, poate nu, la care nu v-ați gândit, probabil, oamenii aceștia nu sunt mânați întotdeauna doar de de dorința, e de adevăr, o dorință emoțională, cea de regăsire, de a înțelege mai bine contextul, de ce au plecat bătrânii, adică de ce, ce i-a trimis de acasă, unde aici aveau pământul și aici sunt întâmplator. E, dar mai există încă o categorie, care sunt cei care vor să își dobândească, se n-aș putea zice redobândească, dar să își dobândească cetățenia. Și în Banat știți că, având în vedere, dacă mergem măcar 100 de ani în urmă, cetățenia putea să fie ori maghiară, ori română, și asta este un demers puțin mai, mai puțin emoțional, mai, mai mult birocratic, dar am să vă, să vă povestesc o situație. S-a întâmplat la Timișoara, am avut o cerere din Mexic. Cum Dumnezeu era America, știam de America, de Canada, Mexic. Și doamna respectivă îmi spune, uite, bunica mea, nu, era așa, stră, 
stră bunica mea, s-a născut, sper să-mi greșesc undeva, în 1852. Da? La Timișoara. Bun. Întâmplarea face că era dintr-o familie de nobili, familia Georgevici. Și ne punem și săpăm. Și spune, ok, ea s-a născut, dar părinții ei sunt Catarina Georgevici de Apadia, respectiv Franz Rosenfeld. Nu sună, nu sună nici oricum de ei la catolici sau căsători. Și adevărat, s-au căsători la Viena la catolici, copiii au fost botezați catolici. Probabil că domnul era, ofițerul era un evreu convertit. De unde până unde Mexic? No, întâmplarea face de Franț Iosef, de Franț Iosef ați auzit, dar avea mai mulți frați, unul dintre ei era Maximilian, care a avut niște împăratul Maximilian al Mexicului. S-a dus ăsta din Austria, da, a vrut el să, să fie împăratul Mexicului. Sunt niște povești, dacă n-am nici n-ai să intrăm în detalii, dar imaginați-vă că la un moment dat, fratele lui Franț Iosef, acest Maximilian Atic, vrea să fie, are pretenții din acestea uh, imperialiste, se duce frumos în, uh, în Mexic și, bineînțeles, își ia cu el Uh, oștenii, da? comandanții ofițerii și le-a acest uh, Franz Rosenfeld împreună cu familia lui. Deci, evreu convertit la catolicist, căsătorit cu uh, Catarina uh, Georgevici de Apadia, da? titlul, titlul nobilial bun, tras clar din nobil sârbi, așa, și cu tot, toți copiii și ajung în Mexic. Nu știu dacă știți soarta, soarta lui Maximilian. Așa? Bineînțeles că mexicanii, hai să fim serioși, împărat austriac Habsburg. Da. L-au curățat, l-au, rez- l-au rezolvat repede, l-au împușcat, dar familia asta a rămas în continuare în Mexic. Da. Și acum avem Timișoreanu și toate spițele alea amestecate, care sunt cetățeni mexicani și care acum își fac demersurile să devină cetățeni maghiari, de fapt. <laughs> da, după toate astele. Și vorbim despre cazul cel mai îndepărtat cumva în timp, dar ca să înțelegem, o să vă explice și filmul, dar ca o idee, ca să înțelegem de ce s-a plecat foarte mult în perioada în care strămoșii, probabil și ai dumneavoastră, sau fie au plecat, fie s-au și întors, sau au rămas acolo, sau rudele, este o chestiune legislativă care se întâmplă la finalul secolului al XIX-lea. Imaginați-vă, până atunci o familie avea, mă rog, cât avea pământ și ea. Legea moștenirilor prevedea în felul următor că primul născut masculin da, moștenea pământul, iar ceilalți fetele se căsătoreau în altă gospodărie, ceilalți învățau meserie sau erau zilieri, se descurcau. Ești, la un moment dat, această lege a moștenirilor se schimbă și devine ceea ce este acum, iar familia, părinții, dar odată ce, ce mor, urmează să lase în urmă tot pământul respectiv împărțit egal între toți copiii, cum ar fi cazul actual. E, în momentul respectiv vă dați seama că acel hectar, mă rog, erau 10 sau câte erau, se împarte în uneori și 10 bucăți. Da? Practic nimeni nu mai are suficient încât să, să supraviețuiască. Se ajunge la o suprapopulare, se ajunge la o sărăcie din punctul ăsta de vedere și oamenii pe motive economice au, au nevoia să, să plece în contextul în care în Statele Unite era mult pământ încă da, de exploatat și în al doilea începe și perioada de industrializare și se duce vestea acum că e momentul să vină pentru că lumea cum era țara tuturor posibilităților și hai să o luăm de la zero. E, aceasta este așa foarte pe scurt nu știu că scurt a fost, dar că vă spuneam că eu nu mai controlez să dau drumul, dar uh, asta a fost o introducere, numai ca să vă faceți un pic ideea legat de ceea ce se întâmplă în paralel cu noi. Există astfel de dorințe ale unor oameni, doresc să se regăsească, să-și înțeleagă trecutul uh, și, as- și, bineînțeles, să, să vină aici, astfel încât s-ar putea să vă întâlniți de multe ori pe străzi sau să aveți uh, americani prin, uh, prin o gradă și nu știți ce cu ei. Mai mergem, ne mai rugăm uneori, să ne mai deschid o casă, mă lăsați să intru în curte. <laughs> și uite așa, uh, am ajuns în casele multora, multora dintre bănățeni cu rugămintea asta, am mai primit o cafea, au primit o cărămidă din fundație. <laughs> Poveștile sunt multe. Uh, vă mulțumesc mult pentru atenție, vă doresc vizionarea plăcută și uh, continuăm Uh, vă rugăm să nu plecați după, după ce uh, se încheie filmul, pentru că urmează o parte la fel de interesantă, nu ca a mea, ca, ci ca a filmul. Uh, am spus să avem oaspeți uh, online din Statele Unite uh, și povești de familie și de regăsire. Uh, rămâneți cu noi. Bine! Mulțumesc!
Romanians began immigrating in large numbers to the United States in the early 1900s. The commonly held belief is that immigrants to America came here to start a better life. The fact is many Romanian immigrants came to this land of opportunity with no intentions to stay. Their story is different from those of other ethnic groups who arrived as early as the 1840s to settle in Minnesota. The ethnic Romanians were part of a wave of Eastern European immigrants who were drawn to the United States by the abundance of industrial jobs. Most of the early Romanian immigrants were men with a mission of mie și drumul, or a thousand dollars and home again. Their intent was to stay just until they had earned enough money to buy property in their homeland. In fact, more than two thirds of the Romanians who came to the United States eventually returned home. However, the stories of those who stayed in this country were not so straightforward. Theirs are stories of plans that had changed, of perseverance and triumph over adversity. Many of these immigrants suffered tremendous losses, but they were determined to make better lives for their children. They went on to establish a thriving community that slowly dispersed after the Second World War. Yet we can still see evidence of the Romanian language and traditions more than 100 years after their arrival. Documenting the experiences of these early immigrants for future generations honors their memory. Their personal stories cannot be found in history books. Stories like the one of John Serafolian's grandfather who emigrated from Romania in 1910. I imagine it was just to have a better life. You can imagine how adventurous uh, you'd have to be to, at the age of 20 to leave your wife and daughter and come all that way to America. I'm sure that there were Romanians over here already that he was communicating with and that told him how, uh, how the streets were paved with gold. <laughs> but uh, that usually meant working at uh, a packing house or, uh, or some kind of uh, low education labor. At the turn of the 20th century, ethnic Romanians were spread across a vast territory that was then part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. They often had neighbors of Serbian, Hungarian, or German heritage, yet they were all subjects of the empire. Their primary spoken language was Romanian, and most of them belonged to the Eastern Orthodox Church. My parents were living uh, under the Hungarian government at the time and times were very, very hard. They weren't paid well, and so with a lot of other people, they decided to come for the reason to make money, to send money back home, and uh, they stayed. Civil unrest and disputes amongst ethnic groups dominated the politics of Austria-Hungary. Conditions were desperate. Phil Tuckanita recalled his grandparents were motivated to leave when they sensed that war was approaching. They uh, immigrated a little later, uh, I would guess somewhere around 1910, 1911. I'm sure it was to dodge uh, the forthcoming First World War. They weren't particularly uh, excited about existence in Romania at the, in those days. It must have been quite tough. They were happy to come to the United States, make a thousand dollars, and perhaps move back and buy some land. The decisions for immigrants to leave their families were difficult. There are many heartbreaking stories of families who became separated for years, some of whom were never reunited. My dad's uh, parents left in 1928. Uh, partly because there was land to be given and, uh, and ventures to be sought in, in the New World, and which was at that time Canada and the United States, uh, was offering an acre of land for a dollar. So my grandfather was such an adventurous type of a person that he said, let's go. Uh, well, 
And what happened was that my dad, in the meantime, was born, and he was one, one and a half years old when they left, and they left him behind partly because of the fact that they heard of all the, all the stories of, of uh, the various uh, problems and, and diseases and uh, dysentery and various things on the ships because they came by ship, by boat. And so they didn't want anything to happen to him, so they left him behind with his grandparents, uh, hoping, hoping that they would be able to bring him later and to see what was happening, or maybe make some money in, in the United States, in Canada, in America, in America, they call it, in America. They would make some money in America to be able to come back and then have a, a, a nicer life. My paternal grandparents brought two children with them, and my dad was left in Romania because he was over a certain age and they would have had to pay transportation for him. Transportation at that time was $32 per adult, uh, and children were free. But he being over five or six, they would have had to pay transportation. So he was left. He came to this country in 1911 as a teenager of 17. I don't know if you've ever been in a, in a, in a group of Romanians saying goodbye to each other, but it's it's quite uh, it's, it's it's quite an experience. There's uh, families are very close, and was hard to leave. They would, they would separate and they would, they would remarry only to find themselves out, find out later that they found themselves and there's nothing that they could, they could do about it. Some very, very heartbreaking stories like that had occurred. And, and yet at the same time, people worked hard at it because they, they wanted to find that new life. The majority of early Romanians who came to St. Paul and South St. Paul were peasant farmers from Transylvania or the Banat region, which is located in the western part of present-day Romania and part of Serbia. Many Romanians came from Siniculau Mare, or as some called it, Simicluș, and other nearby villages. The Tokanitas and the Sarafulians were two of those families. They were from the Hungarian name of Simicluș, it's St. Nicholas the Great, and it's a town, uh, oh, I would say about 60 kilometers from uh, Timisoara, which is in Banat, Romania. And of course, my dad uh, somehow knew my mother because they all came from this, the town of uh, Simicluș. Well, I'll start with my grandparents, and they were born in Romania in a town called Saravali in Timis County in uh, western Romania, close to the border to Serbia, in an area called Banat. And uh, Banat was, a, was an enclave of uh, Hungarians, Germans, Serbs, Romanians in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Quite a bit of history there, and then constantly moving borders made it difficult to uh, know which country you were really in for a while. Once they had established themselves in America, the men sent encouraging letters to their family and friends at home, which in turn attracted more Romanians to make the long journey over. Traveling alone, John's grandfather arrived in America in 1910. He left his wife and infant daughter in Saravali with the uh, hope of getting a job at the Ford Motor Company in Detroit, Michigan, which he was successful in doing. And after being there a few months, he transferred to the Twin City Ford plant. In 1912, my grandfather sent to Romania for his wife and infant daughter to come over. They got here on February 22nd, 1912. So it was a combination of long train rides and long boat rides to get here. By the time the immigrants arrived in America, they were exhausted and sought the support and comfort of people they knew. For many, it was the first time they had ever left their village. They had saved or borrowed for months or years to pay for the tickets for transportation. They traveled by train or wagon just to get to the port where they would board the ship, hauling their limited possessions and often the food for their journey. The steamships were crowded, and most immigrants traveled in steerage class, in the bellies of the ships. A crossing could take anywhere from a week to more than a month, depending on the ship and the weather. My father, when he arrived, he had one trunk and five dollars. And my mother came from another part of the 
this, the country. And uh, she also had one trunk and seven dollars. Travel conditions were very, very difficult because just getting to the port, I can't imagine how they got there, but uh, being on ship, many of them ended up in steerage or third class, and it took a lot longer than it does now by, by ship. Shipping companies advertise steamship fares to America in European newspapers. The port of Hamburg was the most popular for ticket agencies used by Romanian travelers. John Serfalian found his grandmother Sophia listed on the passenger manifest of a ship sailing from the northern German port of Cuxhaven, where the slogan was, America is just around the corner. The name of the ship was the Pennsylvania, and it left from Cuxhaven, Germany, which Cuxhaven is a seaport at the mouth of the Elbe River. Uh, there were a lot of other ports where uh, these immigration ships left from Bremerhaven, and Hanover, and, um, but she left from a smaller one called Cuxhaven. Romanian immigrants were mainly attracted to the industrial cities of the north, including Cleveland, Detroit, Pittsburgh, and Chicago. Through word of mouth and family connections, many Romanians eventually made their way to Minnesota. The word came from the United States that there was much work to be done here. My father came first to New York, and then he went to Philadelphia first, and then to St. Paul in 1907. My mother came from a different town in 1912, and uh, came directly to St. Paul. Uh, they all congregated around the Romanian community and the Romanian church here. The Romanian populations in St. Paul and South St. Paul grew very quickly. For example, newspapers tell us that between 1907 and 1909, roughly 300 Romanian men arrived in South St. Paul alone. By 1920, about 2,000 ethnic Romanians were living within the two cities, and by 1930, that number was estimated to be more than 5,000. A lot of it had to do with people knowing someone who was already here, and then people following up in footsteps and saying, hey, I know somebody in St. Paul, and they, they have the meat packing houses in South St. Paul, and many of the people, by word of mouth, uh, came and, uh, because many of them were, were essentially peasants who, who had labor-type jobs, and uh, uh, they learned how to become butchers and uh, uh, meat packers. That's why they settled in South St. Paul, is because of the packing house. It, it provided uh, employment but the Romanian community was here. This is where the Romanians came. They came here and St. Paul, uh, right around Rice Street area. Most of them had, had jobs, like factory jobs or, or stuff like that, you know, labor type work. And some of them had their own businesses. They all bought homes, one right next to another. You know, by the Romanian church, when I grew up there, for two blocks, you probably wouldn't hit anybody that wasn't a Romanian. We shouldn't forget South St. Paul was built by immigrants because they came here because they could get jobs at the plant and not know the language. One of the reasons for many of the people to be bound together is because they had a common language, so that's why they, they drifted towards one another in, in the, in the uh, Orthodox communities and the churches and around, around places where uh, where they could uh, socialize, and that's what they did. Blue-collar jobs were easy to find before the Depression, but the work typically involved hard physical labor. Anne Bongard and Anne Murphy recalled their father's experiences in St. Paul in the early 1900s. He walked up Dale Street and he passed the Great Northern Railroads. Some fellow came out and says, hey, you look like a, a sturdy young fellow. He said, Come on in, we have employment for you and that was he was here then two weeks that's how he got hired at the railroads he worked at a u.s betting company he worked at the saint paul foundry company in saint paul he was laid off during the depression for seven years and filled in with odd jobs in the wpa and then was hired back at the saint paul foundry and he retired from from there so it was his life's work by 1910, unskilled immigrant laborers were flocking to St. Paul and South St. Paul for jobs. 
During the meatpacking heyday, Armour and Company had more than 4,000 employees who slaughtered and processed more than 2,000 animals per hour. There were thousands more jobs at nearby Swift and Company and across the river at Cudahy's located in Newport, Minnesota. The plants produce not just meat, but byproducts including lard, dog food, leather, and soap. The work was grueling, and the stench could be unbearable. Rather than work in the plants, some Romanians decided to open their own businesses. My dad was Mitchell Vasilia Choban. The story goes, when he went to apply for a job at Swift and Company, or one of the packing plants, he stood one day or didn't even stay and left it. And then he got a job at Drover's Bank, which is called Bremer Bank, I think now, because he knew Romanian and some of the other languages. A lot of Europeans came here because of the packing plants. When they knew someone knew their language, they came to him. My grandfather was Gus. He had a a joint down there, a beer joint, I suppose they called them back in them days. Of course, there used to be a lot of them on Concord Street before they tore it down. My mother was born in South St. Paul uh, on Concord Street. My grandfather had a business. He owned uh, a restaurant. My uncles, they were very well known in the community of South St. Paul. They were the true, the true American. Many men did acquire enough money to return to Romania. They paid their debts and bought land in order to improve their positions rather than to escape agriculture. More than two-thirds of those who arrived in the United States between 1900 and 1925 ended up returning to Romania, most of them after World War I and the Romanian land reforms of 1921, which allowed them to own property. Various newspaper accounts tell of Romanians returning home with large sums of money. Among them were Vasile Jura's grandparents and their American-born children who went back in 1930. That's how they made the money in the, in the stockyard. They worked very, very hard. However, they went back and, and into the Romania and uh, they got caught during the World War II. And uh, Stalin, Gheorghe Desh, the people who were in charge at that time, they kind of put a stop so they couldn't come back to their own country. Often, Romanian men and their families moved around North America in order to join friends and relatives or seek better employment. It was a surprisingly mobile society at a time when money was tight and transportation options were limited. There were more jobs offered in the cities. As a matter of fact, that's how my grandfather and grandmother started because my grandmother worked in this, uh, in this sewing factory where they had a thousand ladies working in this sewing factory by sewing and making pants, etc. And she was telling me about that she'd worked like, you know, 12 to 14 hours a day sewing these pants and moving them over. And because of the fact that there were so many more opportunities, people stayed within the, uh, within the community close by, plus they had connections with one another so they could, you know, feed off one another and get, you know, networking, etc. Uh, my grandfather came first and uh, lived in Philadelphia for a short while and then came to St. Paul. I think because of the affiliation between the city and Romania and, uh, you know, the Benetzinesk folks, and uh, he came to St. Paul. Romanian communities grew up around the Rice Street area of St. Paul and Concord Street in South St. Paul. Other smaller communities of Romanians settled in Duluth and Minneapolis. The railroad industry employed many Romanians and other immigrants in the business of loading and unloading trains and maintaining the tracks and equipment. One of these was Phil Tokanita's grandfather. He was a painter's helper, and he worked for the railroad, which was very nice, as he called it, the Northern Pacific, and it went to Navy Ord in Iowa, Iowa and New York, and he would, uh, uh, paint boxcars, as did most of the Romanians. I think they helped each other uh, achieve some, you know, vocation when they got here. So many people either worked at the railroads together, worked at the hotels together, worked at packing houses together, and there were three packing houses. There was Armour, Swiss, and, and Cudahy's, and a lot of women worked in laundries. Some of them would have boarding houses, and and newcomers would stay at boarding houses. They were on North Concord Street, most, most of them. Very small, 
almost dilapidated houses on the side of the steep banks. When I think of those houses, I think of the one my grandmother rented on 4th Avenue South. It hung over this steep bank and below it was South St. Paul City Hall. If the train would go by down by Swift and Company, it would rattle the windows. You know. As people came in, they'd take them in as boarders until they could you know, find a place of their own. And my grandfolks used to talk about, well, some people worked at the railroad, some people worked at foundries, and they'd work different shifts. In an effort to become Americanized, many Romanians modified their first or last names. For example, Romanian men's given names were changed from Ioan to John, from Savu to Sam. In America, Tivador became Steve, and Atanasie became Tom. The woman's name, Yalitza, was changed to Alice. Last names became even more interesting with any number of possible spelling variations. One example is the name Triljai, which was changed to Thurley, probably after its owner was asked one too many times how his name was spelled. He was from um, San Nicolao Mare, and my mother was from Nero. They were neighbor, neighboring towns, and she was Elena, but when she went to school in America, she became Eleanor. I've only got about three or four pictures of my dad. His name was Timo. He's buried up in South St. Paul at Oak Hill. I don't know his, who his parents were. Uh, I never asked my ma. It's things you should have asked. He shortened the name. It, was, it used to be Stoyanov. To complicate matters further, it was customary for Romanians to assign each other nicknames. At the time, many of the Romanians uh, had nicknames. Uh, like my grandfather was uh, Turku, or Turk, the Turk. And uh, my grandmother was Spekutze. My grandfather on my dad's side was Pelia, yeah, which is skin. And they would refer that, you know, they perhaps would say, uh, the boss uh, wants to see Pelia, better go tell him, not Mr. Tokonita or John or anything like that. The Romanians who decided to stay made it a priority to save money to buy homes, and they usually had a garden plot and some livestock in their yards. Poor family in a poor neighborhood. There wasn't, city lights were not in St. Paul yet. We had an outhouse in the backyard. Different. They would walk to South St. Paul, you know, from Rice Street, because I think at that time the uh, trolley was something like a nickel, and I don't think they were making uh, much per hour. I, I would guess probably 30 or 40 cents. They were very frugal and probably bought houses. I know my grandfather bought the house on Albemarle, and at the time it was about $1,200. Most of the people, well, almost all of the people, didn't own their own house. They had to rent. So it was a tough life, and the more people in the family you could get to stay home together, the more money was on the table. So it's nice to have uh, four or five or six people with a job living in the house. My Aunt Anna, she worked at Armors. One of the few women that I knew that actually had a job, worked, you know, most of them stayed home. I remember uh, my father making, I don't know, $28 a week in the late 30s, $30 a week. So that was considered, a, you could get by on that. Good paying jobs. When I say good, it's, uh, it's relative. Romanian people, the ones that came here, you know, back then, they, they didn't have a lot. They didn't have a lot of money and they were relatively poor. But they all had a garden. They all made sure they grew their, you know, vegetables and things like that. And then they would do canning and things of that nature to, to spread things out. My mother and dad, they grew up during the Depression. And um, my dad told stories about that, you know, about how hard up people were, soup lines and things like that, you know. But he never said he had to do any of that because he worked at Swift and they made some money. Uh, not a lot of money, I mean. He said he made good money, and he was making 14 bucks a week. <laughs> I can't even imagine that. But back then, you could buy 
a lot more stuff for 14 bucks than you can today. It seemed that the Romanian people that came here, the majority of them worked at Swift or Armors. In South St. Paul Surf owners worked in the packing houses. My father quit school when he was 14, and his brother Peter quit school when he was 13. They had to go to work. They wrapped their lunches in newspaper with string tied around them. And I can just see my father and his brother, young teenagers, walking down to the river in South St. Paul. And there was a ferry that took men from our side of the river to Newport if they worked at the George Cudahy packing house. When the United States entered into World War I, all resident aliens who had not been naturalized were required as a security measure to register with the U.S. Marshal's Office or else risk internment or deportation. This registration occurred between November 1917 and April 1918. Some Romanians eventually found themselves back in Europe fighting in the war. Joe Stoy's father came to this country when he was a teenager around 1917, and shortly after arrival, he enlisted in the service of the United States. He uh, was in World War I, got gassed. Uh, back then they had gas masks, but he got gassed and developed TB, and he died. In later years, he, he was 34 years old. He was born in 1900 and he died in 34. Another of Joe Stoy's family members who died young was his maternal grandmother, Elizabeth Sekoshan. She died in South St. Paul in 1916 in her early 30s, shortly after giving birth to her fourth daughter. Joe's grandfather was unable to care for his young children and had to place the girls in an orphanage in St. Paul. They were there for almost three years until he could afford to bring his sister-in-law to America as his new bride. Meanwhile, the youngest daughter was adopted by a family from Detroit, and they never saw her again. Like many South St. Paul girls, Joe's mother grew up to work for the packing plants. My mom worked at Peter Sausage for almost, almost 45 years. That was a long time. She was a hard-working woman. Jobs for women and children were supposedly not as physically demanding as men's and paid less per hour. But some jobs were paid by the piece so they could earn more by working faster. Usually those jobs required dexterity, such as packaging sliced bacon, filling sausage casings, or wrapping lard and smoked meats. Just as it was for boys, earning a wage was often more important to a family's survival than gaining an education. Well, my mother worked at the packing house. She was uh, at Armors, and she was a, what they call the floor lady. They worked uh, at uh, cleaning intestines, uh, and she was supervisor. It was hard work. They worked in constant water. Her father decided that when you were 16, you better get a job, and that's exactly what happened. I believe the only one on my mother's side, uh, the only sister that finished high school was uh, Lee Pilati. In 1923, employees of the South St. Paul Meatpacking Companies received a 10% wage increase to about 40 cents an hour. By 1939, laborers' wages went up to 49 cents an hour. But packing house employees also had to buy their own equipment, such as knives, sharpening steels, and clothing. If they couldn't afford safety equipment like mesh gloves and heavy leather aprons, they did without. There was no union at Swift, and so they'd work 10, 12 hours a day. When you didn't have a union there, it was bad. They could do anything they want with you. I could tell you stories that you wouldn't believe, but no, they treated you they didn't treat you good. They didn't, never got no time and a half if you worked over eight hours. They didn't have no vacations. They didn't have nothing. They did nothing, you just worked. That's all you had. I think it was terrible. I think it was terrible. Fraternal benefit and cultural societies were established in the days before there was public assistance. Romanians paid dues to belong to local groups like Augustina in St. Paul and Alexandru Chelbun in South St. Paul. Each had its own flag and ceremonial sashes that were proudly worn at community events. 
Dues were paid monthly and provided families with small insurance policies in case a man became sick or died. These societies also supported the establishment of Romanian Orthodox churches. St. Mary's in St. Paul in 1913 and St. Stephan's in South St. Paul in 1924. St. Mary's in St. Paul is a replica of a church in San Nicolau Mare, the village where many of the early immigrants came from. St. Stephan's in South St. Paul is a domed octagonal church in the Byzantine style, also known as Eastern or Greek Orthodox. While the exterior designs of the two churches are quite different, the interiors are similar. Inside, they are both richly decorated with painted icons. Everybody was pretty close to the church. If you look at St. Stephan's, my grandmother has a scowan or chair right next to the altar as an early founder of the church. Which, uh, just an aside, at one time uh, there were no pews in the church and you had to actually bid for the chairs, pay for the chairs. Very primitive of chairs, uh, perhaps uh, a board that wide, it folded up, but you had your own place to rest. Otherwise you stood like everybody else. As I recall, there was some, some seats around the perimeter of the narthex where people, some people could sit, probably the larger contributors in the church. The rest of the people stood during the service and they had this ornate pulpit. The decisions to build churches signified that the Romanian community was here to stay. The churches provided a central hub for both religious and social life. It was given, you went to church. My mother was president of the Ladies' Aid and they did a lot of cooking. Uh, they had quite a number of uh, uh, banquets and uh, would cook after church. It was rather a close group. I would say between the two cities, there was 1,500, 1,800, 2,000 people, Romanian people at one time, and maybe about 10 families that lived in Minneapolis. And those 10 families attended the St. Paul Church but because uh, it was the closest church. But if there was a celebration of birthdays or, or weddings or, or funerals or whatever, in either church, it were attended by all people. It was just an open invitation at all times. It was a good feeling. The Depression years would prove especially hard for some families. When jobs were scarce, some tried farming, and it became more common for women to work outside the home. One of these women was Anne Bungard's mother, who had to find work when her husband became unemployed. She had worked at Swiss for a while, she worked at Packet House for a while, and they would hire women because they, were, they could pay women less money. If they worked fast, they could do piecework and they would get paid extra for the more that they cut and roll and produce. She was our sole breadwinner, you might say, for years and years until she became sick. My father ended up at Swift & Company, probably 1932, 34. Hiring boss would come out the front door every morning and pick and choose or call names off for the guys that would work that day and the rest would go home. In the 1930s and 40s, evidence of old world customs was still present at funerals and other events. Phil Tokanita and others recalled the tradition of placing the body of the deceased in the church hall for several days so that people could pay their respects before services and burial, usually Oakland Cemetery in St. Paul or Oak Hill in South St. Paul. One of the things that I remember at the funerals they had women who wailed. They were dressed in black, all in black, and they would throw themselves on to the casket and wail. My dad said that they would hire wailers, people that would uh, really cry and carry on. The people were laid out at home, in the, in the homes, maybe for several days. People used to just camp out there and visit, and uh, it was, a lot different from nowadays. They performed the service in the church and then went to the cemetery. They uh, would come back and then have a dinner, a few drinks and everything else. 
Old newspapers tell of many fundraising and holiday events in the Romanian community, sometimes held at the Serbian Hall in South St. Paul, where larger crowds could be accommodated. Eugenie Vascu fondly remembered his experiences at the annual St. John's Dinner, which he often attended at St. Mary's Church. We would have a dinner. After dinner, we would take the tables down and, and make a dance floor and put some tables around the dance floor where you could sit. And, and you dance. I mean, you dance horas and, and, and matitas. And, and I mean, till one, two o'clock in the morning, we'd have a dance, you know. And then people would drink, and they had a bar in the basement and stuff. But um, it was a big party, and it was every year that was a big thing. And they had youth clubs, too. Saturday afternoons, they'd have a Nickelodeon in the hall, and they would automatically plug it in. You didn't have to put any money in it, but you had music. The church ladies auxiliary paid for that. I remember some of the old timers that were here that I met, like Jim Capetti's and Dan Montines and uh, so many different people from here, from South St. Paul and, and the Motsu family, etc. I remember them telling me stories about that every Friday night, they down at the hall, at the, either at the Romanian Hall or South St. Paul, they'd have a dance. They'd have a dance with an orchestra and everything else. That they would they would dance till they till the morning time. Uh, at that time, all of those things that were not available to them, such as the Internet and the Mall of America, and that was their social outlet. That's where they got to meet one another, see what was happening, and, and talk about uh, their jobs, and have some food, and have some sarmale as well. As the years passed, most of the Romanians remained connected to the Orthodox Church, but not all of them. One reason was that it became more common for Romanian men to marry women outside of their ethnic group and religious denomination, and they wanted to raise their children in a different faith, such as Methodist or Lutheran. Another reason was that members of the younger generation could not always speak Romanian, and unlike some of the other local ethnic churches, the Romanian Orthodox churches remained committed to the practice of conducting services solely in the Romanian language. If you wanted to belong to the church, you had to learn Romanian. My aunt, uh, Lee, who never did really catch on to Romanian, went to the Polish Catholic Church a few doors down from Grandma's house in South St. Paul. At that time, Romanian was the main language, and uh, even the priest may not have spoken English. When the community recognized in the 1930s that the children and grandchildren of original immigrants were at risk of being lost to the church, Romanian language classes were established at both St. Mary's and St. Stefan's. The teachers were the Romanian priests. And years ago as a child, we had used to have Romanian classes that you learned Romanian language and to read and write. We'd go after school and then on Saturday mornings, and then we also had Romanian school at St. Stephen's Church. My sisters and I went to that. And my favorite time there was when, the, when we had lunch, Priotus Odus home for lunch or somewhere. And the boys went to their favorite spot somewhere where they played and the girls could sit at any desk and we had our afternoon till the, they came back. <laughs> And I don't, I remember that more than our lessons. I, I don't remember anything else but maybe the songs he wrote and then we copied them in our books, uh, the words of the song. Well, I'll tell a little rhyme. Yer pe drum un om sarak un trebat pe la vecin sa poarte copii bine dacă nu se bag în sac. O venit la min la ușă La mine la ușă și-am ieșit eu și i-am spus, Puiul meu e bun și tace, nu ți-l dau și du-te în pace. When I was younger, I, I went, when I went to church, I was a cantor at one time of the Romanian church, and I could read Romanian. I didn't understand what it said, but I could read it because I could pronounce the words. Regardless of church affiliation, most local Romanians preserve their old world traditions, especially those related to holidays. Oh, the Easter traditions. One of the things that my parents did, they used red onion leaves 
in the, in the, in the solution. And the eggs would come out beautiful, golden brown, and they would have a pattern on them where the leaves touched the egg. When they were cooled, the eggs were cooled, we took lard in our hands and we polished the eggs to a beautiful shine. They have a custom of chicking eggs. They would, um, you color eggs and, and um, my dad and I would go with five dozen eggs a piece to the church and you you took the, the skinny end against the other skinny end you try to see how many eggs you break. An egg that we thought was strong with the tip up and held it with our forefinger and our thumb and then another person would come along with his strong egg and he would peck and if he cracked that egg that egg was his. It was a lot of fun for young and old. My dad would bless the kolaches, which was braided bread. After they were, all of these breads were, were blessed, he would, they would be packaged with apples and oranges and nuts in the shell and the candle that was with the kolache when it was blessed. And we, my brother and I would go from one house neighbor to another and present them with these goodies and uh, it was all looked forward to and we thought it was nice because we could show off our nice clothes. <laughs> New Year's my mother used to make strudel and she'd put money in it and when you're a kid you know it was this nickels and dimes and maybe a quarter here and there you know that was big money when I was a kid. I'd eat that stuff till I was all the way up to my head you know it's with pastry but you got it for a lousy dime or a nickel. Ann Bongard remembers how the community was still following traditions from Romania, such as the door-to-door -door wedding invitation, when she came here in the 1930s. And a bottle, uh, a bottle of whiskey in their hands, and they'd go knocking at the door and say, we came to invite you to the wedding. Everybody in the family would have to have a drink of each bottle, including the fellows. So they could get pretty high by the time they were through for the evening. And they'd go to house to house. And this was sending a formal invitation started way after the Second World War. So this is the way you invited. It. it was a fun way. And, and of course, you have to prepare for the wedding so you'd have a party. You'd prepare the wedding dinner so you'd have a party. And you'd have to clean up after the wedding so you'd have a party. That could go on for five days. It was always fun. Many Romanian Americans share particularly strong memories related to the preparation of foods by recipes that were handed down from one generation to the next. The early versions of these recipes called for fresh ingredients that were prepared at home and featured the use of lard instead of butter. It had a better flavor than your commercial prepared lards that you have today. It had a, a richer flavor. So it was very well used. Butter was something that became more used after the Second World War, when it became cheaper and more plentiful. I remember my grandmother cutting a lot of chickens' heads off. She raised chickens, and uh, <laughs> as a four or five-year-old boy, uh, experiencing that was, uh, you know, that left a mark seeing this chicken running around. They had a, a little stump out in the backyard that was full of blood all the time. And we ate a lot of chicken. She was a great cook. When we used to have like a St. John's dinner, which was, was a holiday when they were in the Orthodox faith, right around the first of the year, they would go to um, a farmer and buy pigs, big <coughs> pigs, and then they would butcher them at the farm and then they would uh, take hay and singe the hair on, in the field with, with, the cow, with the pigs, and then they'd come back in a barn and scrub them off. And then they'd take all of the carcasses and bring them back to the Romanian church in St. Paul in the basement. They'd be cutting up these things, and they all were all meat cutters. I mean, they, every one of them knew how to work with a knife, and you know, they made sausages, and they, it was a phenomenal dinner. My grandfather, I used to eat with him a lot, 
He, uh, you ever see that uh, bacon fat like they put in pork and beans? You ever see you buy it in little chunks, salt pork? We used to eat that raw with garlic, homemade bread, and I had a big glass of milk. I was just a young guy, and I loved it. And then when I was still eating it when I got married, and I stunk for a week. So my wife, my wife says, don't you ever eat that garlic again? <laughs> but I did, I did. Romanian sausage and uh, pork cutlets and uh, one of my favorite dishes, even though the poor man's meal, if you call it poor boy meat, is mamaliga, which is cornmeal. And uh, we just love various, my mom used to make various types of of uh, cornmeals with, uh, with eggs and smintina. And smintina is sort of like uh, yogurt on top and you put an egg on, you make the mamaliga with the cornmeal and it's nice and hot and then you put an egg, after you fry an egg, put the egg on top of that and, and the smintina with the, with the yogurt, eh, it's really, really good. You know, sarmale, cabbage rolls, a Romanian cabbage rolls. I have to claim that the Romanians, and no offense to all the other people of all the other ethnic groups that make, make cabbage rolls, but the Romanians make the best cabbage rolls in the world. You have to have a certain touch and flavor to be able to roll that cabbage, put the meat in, and then tuck it all in and sort of like figure it up like making a making a bed sheet, you know, nice and firm. So you have to be able to know how to do that. And some of these ladies could make a thousand cabbage rolls in an hour. I could take me about take, I could make ten. <laughs> cabbage rolls, the Romanians ferment the cabbage. They have a large vat and you put the cabbage heads in there after hollowing them out and putting salt and you add horseradish if you like and uh, it stews in its own juice so to speak. She would mix uh, probably a little bit of veal, a little pork and uh, the barley mixture and then you'd wrap them up. Grandma's favorite saying is when I wrap the sarmalia she chided folks that would put toothpicks in them to hold them together and so on. So when I make it and roll it, you can throw it on a roof, it'll roll down and won't break. See, so you take a piece of dough and you put it like a, a sheet or something over a table and you take this hunk of dough and you put it in the middle of the table and you pull it and it gets paper thin. And then you, you make a concoction of, uh, I don't know what they put in there, you put apples and stuff in there and you run these apples like this here, then you roll it up. And it's, it's very, very, very good. My grandmother had a rolling pin that was five feet long and the big dining room table where she would roll the dough out and then roll it up in a thick rope and then braid it. Before she baked it, I remember she had a goose quill that she would dip in butter and and paint the bread with that so that when it came out of the oven, it was shiny and golden and just beautiful. And you can imagine the smell, you know. But there would be 10 or 12 of these loaves on the table at, in, during the holidays. Karnats, the Romanian sausage, which was pork sausage and natural casings. Uh, it was strictly garlic and black pepper. Uh, one priest, Father Babos, that would take the whole clove and just throw it in the machine and grind it up. And Well, if you asked half the people in the church, they would say too much garlic, and the other half would say not enough garlic. Jimmy Capetti, uh, he was the one that really showed me how to make the sausage, because he used to make it up at the Romanian church all the time. He called me up one time and says, Joe, can you help me make some sausage? I said, sure, how much are you gonna make? He says, 200 pounds. I said, 200 pounds? We made, it took about six or seven hours but we had a good time making the sausage. I had a lot of fun with him. During the 1920s and 1930s, local high schools held Americanization and citizenship classes for adults as immigrant families struggled with the challenges of assimilation. Some families tried to preserve their culture by forcing their children to speak Romanian in the home, while others discouraged it. My dad wouldn't listen to us if we talked English, but to my grandma who didn't know much, English. We did talk to her. She didn't mind. <laughs> but that's how we learned the language, I guess, and kept it. We spoke Romanian in the home with my mother and dad. My brother was five years older than I. Um, we spoke English with one another. Of course, sometimes my being 
a little bit naughty, I'd anger my brother. And then he would not, he would reply in uh, not so nice a way. And mother would say, what are you, what's happening? What are you doing? Oh, my dear brother was kind and even though he was angry, he'd say, oh, uh, it's nothing, mom. We're, it's just, we're just fooling around. <laughs> After they passed away, I had forgotten most of it, which is sad. After my mother passed away, or even when my brother reached four years old, they decided that they were not going to speak Romanian in the house because it's going to be too hard for my brother to learn English in school. So they started English only in the house. A product of this culture clash was a blend of Romanian and English that can be heard in the community to this day. Phil Tokanita gives this example. We had a fellow by the name of Tony Ardelian. I asked Mrs. Ardelian, and I was about 21, 22, and I said to her, I said, where's Tony? They had the house right next to the church. And she said, so do He went, la, laku, to the lake to pentuiestia botu uh, to paint the boat and they made uh, uh, Romanian uh, uh, English turned into Romanian I guess so this is the type of language that I basically learned I mean I can understand most everything if you speak slow enough by the 1930s, changes to immigration laws and the Great Depression made it hard, if not impossible, to travel between the U.S. and Romania. Some families longed to return to Romania, while others preferred to forget the past. Throughout her lifetime, Anne Logojan Murphy's mother lamented the fact that she could not retrieve Mihai, the young son she left in the care of her father when she left Romania in 1912. Both planned on going back, and they sent money back to their parents. My brother was born then in 1914. The World War I was on, and my half-brother Mihai in Romania was already uh, conscripted into the army at age 16. By the time everything was over, and my brother and I being Americanized, my parents realized that one broken home to uproot us and take us to a foreign country was not in the best interest, even if they could afford it, which they still couldn't. It was sad because they always hoped that they could. It got to the point where there was no one there anymore. However, some Romanians managed to return for brief reunions with family members. John Serafalian related a story of his father's return visit to Romania in 1920, when he was six years old. You, you got to realize there was many hundreds of people on the ship. And my father and his brother Peter got separated from their mother. And it was getting close to departure time or boarding time. And. She didn't know where they were, and they didn't know where she was. And uh, I'm trying to imagine my father at age six, what he was thinking, but he told me he looked up on the ship's deck. He was down on the dock, and he saw the family blanket hanging on in the clothesline, which he recognized. And he took Peter by the hand, and they went, got boarded the ship, and stood by that blanket until <laughs> their mother showed up. Uh, so that might have been frightening for my, my father and his brother. So, so it was uh, one of the few stories he shared with me. So it must have been uh, he, it etched in his mind. Despite the changing times leading up to World War II, traditional Romanian music and dance at both community and church events were a means of preserving their old world culture and memories while living in Minnesota. The dances that were popular in the St. Paul area were from the Banat area where most of the immigrant families originated. The dancers that were here, many of them were from the Banat area and many of the dances that they knew were the old time dances that the, that the Banatsen 
New Orleans, and they were like the Horas, the Surbas, the, the Doyur, or the Invertitas dances, and strictly from uh, from the Banat area, Senakala Omare, from Chinat area, from uh, Beba area. They were unaware until I came that there were other regions of Romania. And I showed them dancers from Altania, and I remember some of the dancers saying, that's not Romanian. And I showed them dancers from Moldova and Transylvania and uh, uh, Owash and Dobroja, and they didn't, uh, they, th they kept telling me that this isn't Romania, I don't know what that is. The Festival of Nations began in Minnesota in 1932. The Romanian dance groups performed, and still do today, at the annual event in St. Paul. It was an important part of growing up for Romanians in the Twin Cities to proudly display your Romanian costumes and perform the dance routines. It was set up to really know about other people's culture and, and share what they liked their food, and it was more of a fellowship, more of a intermingling of races or countries, whatever you want to call it, back then. And it was really uh, a binding of countries. To go and dance at the Festival of Nations, that was something to be proud of. You were, you're putting on your heritage, your Romanian heritage, showing that off. And it, we were proud to be a Romanian. The changes leading up to and after the Second World War also changed the face of the St. Paul ethnic community. Society had become more mobile, it became more common for Romanians to marry outside of their cultures and religion, and the American population began moving from cities to the suburbs. Both Romanian Orthodox churches saw their memberships dwindle, and they often struggled financially. Yet through all of this, a Romanian cultural presence still survives. The Romanian-American descendants display pride in their heritage and most maintain some connection to the churches, even if they no longer practice the Romanian faith. When you come to a place like Minnesota to see these uh, immigrants still portraying and still maintaining what they had left, a semblance of their original language and some traditions some foods and some things like that. It's very, really interesting. In honor of my mother and dad and all the others who came to this country and how they persevered and did their, their best, made their homes here, they built their churches, I feel a lot of pride for them and for myself that I am Romanian, so I'm happy with my heritage. Early Romanian immigrants to St. Paul and South St. Paul left indelible footprints on the Minnesota landscape. They helped build industries and strong neighborhoods and erected churches that are considered architectural gems of the community. Their personal stories of loss and achievement, of hard work and determination, deserve to be remembered. In addition, they instilled a sense of pride of culture and heritage that persist in their Romanian-American descendants today. Uh, she's out there in uh, 
în studioul Times Square Television din, din Statele Unite din Minnesota, împreună cu Doreen Hearn, pe care o văd în spate, uh, și câțiva dintre ei, cred că sunt și dintre vorbitori. Uh, nu știu exact cum să ne aud, ne văd. Vicky, Vicky, can you hear us? I can, yes. Oh, that's lovely. Welcome. We're so happy to see you. It's a little bit quiet. I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing, but I think I can do okay. Okay. Um, trebuie să vorbesc un pic eu mai tare ca să mă audă. Da. Okay. All right. So, I, can you hear me better now? Yes, I can. That's lovely. Uh, can you see the room? Yes. Oh, that's great. Good. Sunteți față în față. <laughs> Wait, puteți să faceți cum una, dacă doriți. Wait back. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Bună seara. <laughs> Vicky, we're just uh, we just finished watching the uh, the movie. It was very touching again. Hello, Doreen. She's there at the back. Um, okay, yeah. I think you can uh, you can start your speech. Okay. Buna sera tuturor. Sunt foarte fericită să fiu invitată să vorbesc cu voi în seara asta. I'm going to speak in English, and I'm going to have to ask Alexander to help me because I'm afraid he wouldn't understand. <laughs> um, I am here at the studio of Tom Square Television where we made the original film eight years ago. And I'm joined here by several people who appeared in the film or who made contributions uh, of photos and documents. And we're really pleased that you've learned about our humble movie from across the world. This is something we never would have imagined when we started our research. This, uh, I just wanted to find out about my great grandfather and instead, We found an enormous Romanian family which extends from Minnesota across the United States and all the way back in San Nicolau Mare, where the story began. All right, we're very honored. <laughs> Now it's my turn. But uh, uh, Vicky se află împreună cu invitații ei, cei din spate, se află uh, în studioul uh, de la Town Square Television, acolo unde în urmă cu 8 ani de zile a fost uh, uh, creat, filmat, să spunem, acest, uh, acest documentar pe care l-ați văzut. Um, urmează să traduc eu în continuare și practic o să lăsăm pe ea să-și spună. Uh, totul, toată aventura a început uh, prin în momentul în care Vicky a început să, să cerceteze, să cerceteze originile, plecând de la, de la străbunicul ei, cel din, din Sfânt Nicolau și uitați unde s-a, unde s-a ajuns. Please, carry on. Uh, I was fortunate to visit Romania in 2016 with three of my colleagues from Romanian Genealogy Society, including Doreen, who's here in the room with me. And there we happened to meet Alexandra Irenia, the Timisor tour guide, and she helped us to discover each of our ancestral villages, including San Nicolau Mare, Canar, Bebeveque, Balkan, and Igrish. Okay. And, uh, okay? Yes. Uh, bun, am avut norocul în 2016 să călătoresc în România, uh, împreună cu, uh, este vorba de cele patru doamne pe care vă povesteam mai devreme, împreună cu încă uh, trei doamne, printre care și Dorin, cea care v-a făcut cu mâna din spate. Uh, Doreen Hearn, uh, momentul în care uh, m-au cunoscut pe mine, pe Alexandra, și uh, cu ocazia aceasta am vizitat uh, locurile de origine ale celor, doare, a celor patru doamne, printre care sunt Nicolau, Cenad, uh, Igriș, Bebalveche și Vulcan, de fapt. Când eram în San Nicolau Mare, eram we fortunate să meet uh, domnul Mandran Gheorghe, care ne-a spus povestii despre his own familie's emigration to the USA. And after the movie was released, uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Yazan Doina uh, recognized a family member in the movie, and they made connections a hundred years later. Uh, the family been apart for a hundred years, and it, it was just uh, very touching. Uh, they were supposed to be here today, but they were not able to be here. Okay. Um, go ahead. Okay. Bun, cu ocazia acestei vizite din 2016, doamnele l-au cunoscut pe domnul Gheorghe Mândran, care a împărtășit povestea propriei familii care a... Care, da, stai pe rând. Așa, și care a împărtășit povestea propriei familii care a migrat în, în Statele Unite. E vorba de vise la Sfânt Nicolau, dar cu aceeași ocazie, într-adevăr, acum așa de la noi puțin, am ajuns și la Vulcan și Adina Galu se află aici împreună cu doamna profesoară de lângă, pe care de asemenea l-am cunoscut cu aceeași ocazie și care au devenit bune colaboratoare. În momentul în care, după aceste povești împreună cu familia Mândran, când a fost vizionat acest film de către, ajutați-mi puțin, da, Dorina? Așa, 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 n-am prins numele de familie, 
care vă face, da, face cu mâna și is waving at you. Uh, doamna a recunoscut, yeah, yeah. A recunoscut uh, și a recunoscut membrii familiei în această filmare și a avut loc această o, o regăsire nu, uh, a familiei după 100 și ceva de ani. Mm-hmm. And as and Adina Dalu, I didn't realize would be there also. Uh, I think we found out that we have DNA connections, so somehow we're related. Probably the people in this room are distant cousins with many of you, and we feel like it's uh, it's it's just as like building a chain, link by link, becoming stronger. Because every day people are learning about their Romanian ancestors, and uh, we want to learn more about them and uh, to bridge this. Uh, divide that has existed for so long. Um, thank you very much for hosting this event tonight because we think it strengthens those bonds. Thank you. Okay, sper să Mulțumesc. Să spune. Sper că am reținut tot ce trebuia să spun. Bine, ideea este că am cunoscut și pe Adina. A fost o surpriză plăcută, nu se așteptau să vină și oaspeții de la Balcani. Um, dar, bineînțeles, cu acele teste s-au, s-au găsit familii și uh, Vicky este convinsă că și printre dumneavoastră în această sală se află uh, multe persoane care ar putea, într-un fel sau altul, să fie înrudite cu fie cei care sunt prezenți în studio sau uh, o mare parte din comunitatea din South St. Paul. Uh, Vicky, dorește să vă mulțumesc pentru că ați găzduit în această seară uh, documentarul uh, lor, al nostru, uh, și vă mulțumește încă o dată pentru invitație și pentru prezență. All right, I think I did it. <laughs> mulțumesc, Alexandra. Thank you, you saved me. You're very welcome, always a pleasure. Uh, do you have any questions? Dacă aveți întrebări pe care doriți să le adresați lor, mie, nouă, sau să împărtășiți câte ceva, mai sunt acolo. Da. Ah, ok. Ok, here there. Vă rugăm. Cu curaj. Anybody? Nu mai trebuie să se părtește. Să cineva. <laughs> ah, right. Yes, this is a good question for you, Vicky. Um, the the question from uh, the lady in uh, right here in the second row is, what was your great grandfather's name? I mean, which family are you descended from in San Nicolau? Oh, okay. My family is Moisescu, and I don't think I have any surviving any family members there that I know of today. Familia mea se numește Moisescu și din câte cred sau știu, nu știu dacă există descendenți din această familie care să fi rămas uh, în Sinicolau. Um, But in the room we have uh, Topinita, Colare, uh, Drago, uh, from uh, In sală mai este... Topinita from uh, San Nicolau. Topinita din San Nicolau. Uh, who else uh, who else am I forgetting? Palade, uh, uh, Dragos, da Dragos e din Hunedoara. Uh, uh, uit pe cineva. Sara Folian, da. Sara Folian. Da. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. uh, there's a lady, There was a lady here on the, in the second row waving when you said Sara Folian. Oh, ah. her husband's right. Is the uh, Sara Folian member? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you can see everybody, but back there, there's your cousins back there. Nu știu dacă vedeți pe toți pe toți cei din spate. More or less, they should, uh, you know, move their heads a little so we see everybody. Do you move your heads? Can can everybody stand up and wave a little bit, maybe? Yeah, yeah. Eu pus să se ridice un pic ca să vedeți pe toți pe cei din spate. All right, I think we have them all. <laughs> Yeah, we were we are in a very limited capacity here. We would have had more people, but because of COVID, we have a small small gathering. Okay, uh, da, ideea era inițial uh, și au spus mai devreme că uh, trebuia să fie mai multă lume prezentă, inclusiv uh, rudele uh, doamnei Iezan, dar uh, și problema și pandemia a fost o problemă de pentru care uh, nu s-au prezentat toți cei care și ar fi dorit. I'm curious, are there people in the audience who have family members who did come to the United States a hundred years ago? Ce mai plăcea să știu dacă în public există persoane ale căror familii au fost acum 100 de ani, care au ajuns în America, poate să-și întors? Yes, there are. Of course, of course, they have several stories to share, I think. Yeah, oh. We want to hear all of them. Okay, so here here goes one of them. This is the I think this is the deputy mayor of Sinicolau, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. Uh, good day for you at you and uh, bună seara pentru noi. Bună seara. Uh, nice to meet you and uh, I want to ask you 
uh, if uh, your research uh, is going uh, out of uh, your state, I mean, uh, my grandmother was born in uh, St. Louis in 1916, and I have a lot of relatives there, their name family is Bogdan, uh, and maybe if you try to, as I told you before, uh, to try to research and to find some other uh, people from Nicolau, because this is uh, an interesting page of our local history. And our kids and nephews, uh, it's very better for them to know who, uh, what uh, their grandmother uh, and fathers do uh, 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. I, I like to thank you and to congratulate you because you are doing uh, this for us, first of all. Uh, am, uh, am întrebat-o pe doamnă dacă uh, cercetarea lor, uh, de fapt, uh, uh, merge dincolo de granițele statului unde se află ei, pentru că sunt mulți smiclăușeni plecați de aici în, uh, în America, chiar străbunicii mei au fost acolo și bunica mea maternă s-a născut în St. Louis și s-a întors după, nu știu, 10-15 ani în, în România. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good question. Um, that's one of the reasons why uh, Doreen and I founded the Romanian Genealogy Society in uh, 2011, because uh, our ancestors did not stay in one place. They moved around a lot, especially in the United States. They, they migrated all around the country in search of jobs and family members. So we find them, yes, in St. Louis, Chicago, uh, New York, uh, 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 Cleveland, uh, Canton, Ohio, uh, and so yes, we have a lot of research on families that have connections all across the United States, okay. and many and many from St. Paul. Bun, asta a fost întrebarea bună și acesta este motivul pentru care în 2011, dacă nu mă înșel, Vicky împreună cu Doreen, deci doamna cu părul lung în fundal, au, fund, au înființat societatea română de genealogie tocmai pentru că strămoșii lor nu au stat, nu au fost fix într-un anumit loc, s-au plimbat după nevoi, după muncă, acolo unde se oferea oportunitatea și, într-adevăr, pe lângă South St. Paul, pe aceștia găsesc și în St. Louis și în alte localități din, din Statele Unite, iar cercetarea ta se merge dincolo de South St. Paul, deci se, se întind și oferă aceste, acest ajutor, de să nu spun servicii, uh, urmașilor, diversilor români de pe întinderea Statelor Unite. Alright. We're good. <laughs> Alright. Adriana, would like to add something? So, uh, in the room we have members of the Yorga family present. And, ca oh, and, hello. and Caputs, hello. also known as Capetti. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we say Capetti. I just call him Capetti. Yeah, so we know many people with those names. Știm, știm mulți oameni care au port acest acest nume de familie în continuare. Yorga, Yorga and Capetti. So? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Funari is another one. Funar. <laughs> Sorry, what was his name? Funar, Funari, we say Funari, but Funar. Okay, Funar. Știm pe cineva există? Ah, uh, there's still, I don't know if there's anybody in the room, though. Yes, yes. Okay, we don't have any Funars in the room, but still many of them in Yeah, there's all kinds. A, a big long list, I can send a list if you want. Deci, pot să vă trimit o listă lungă cu, uh, cu familii pe care le avem încă aici. Am menționat și Foale și, uh, și Sarapole. Uh, da. Ok. Uh, ok, so right behind me. Oh, there I am. Um, there are some pictures that Mrs. Uh, Doina Yezan uh, brought over. I have no idea if you won't be able to see them. Oh, there we go. Yeah, we can see it. There we go. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I had a funeral for the it's a Sardinian family funeral. Like, yeah. Yeah. All right, so this is this is one of them, and there's another one. All right. This is the bar. Yes, 
This no. okay, so this is the uh, Sarapolen barber. This gentleman in <laughs> yeah, the the Sarpolin family, uh, many members of the family were barbers in uh, in Minnesota and Chicago. Yeah. A fost mulți, yeah. uh, mulți frizeri uh, din familia Sarapolin, atât uh, și în da. Minnesota, atât și în Chicago. Că, yeah. Yeah. Uh, a avut uh, cinci copii, toți cinci au fost frizeri la un moment dat, unul singur a renunțat, au rămas mm -hmm. trei băieți și o fată, Ana, Ana, care ulterior a avut și ea o fată și o nepoată, care a fost o gimnastă, am aflat acum de la rudele pe care le-am găsit datorită dumneavoastră. All right, so there's a bunch of, a, a bunch of information that uh, Mrs. Yazan got uh, thanks to you, so thanks to the reuniting the family, that the uncle had five, uh, five children, um, four... Well, one daughter and four sons, of which uh, one well, one one didn't stick to the uh, to the barber, uh, let's say, uh, uh, guild, but the others did. And also, we found out that there are uh, there's a, a, a this daughter had a daughter of her own, which was a gymnast. And this is inf let's say updated information that Mrs. Yazan got from the family abroad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interestingly, my uh, great grandfather worked for that Sarpolian barber when he came here. Ah, yeah. the fact that yeah. the strabunicul Vicky a lucrat pentru frizerii uh, uh, Sarapolian, momentul în care yes. uh, a ajuns în statul de deci, domnul Moisescu. Da. All right, there's something else. Este o fotografie din 1910. So the uh, the uh, funeral picture. Uh, yes, este it is a picture. Okay, so there's a funeral picture dating back to 1910. Este mama. The one in the casket. The one in the casket is John and uh, Mitru, uh, Mitru Sarapolian's mother. Oh. And next to her is her husband, who was born uh, 1841 and died 1932, so quite an old age. Oh. Wow. Am reușit să aflu și părinții uh, lui Petru, cum îi cheamă, este Matei și Floarea, dar pentru că uh, în Sfânt Nicolau documentele de la 1800 la 1900 se făceau la Biserica Ortodoxă Sârbă, nu am putut să obțin datele lor de naștere de ces. Știu doar că yeah. Petru s-a născut în 1841 și a fost tatăl fraților, Mitru, Michael și John și uh, s-a născut în 1841, a murit în 1932. So, uh, all right. <laughs> so, Mrs. Dizan did, so, did some research uh, regarding the family. So, the husband, so we, we had the lady in the coffin. And uh, her husband is by her side, the one who was born uh, 1841 and passed away 1932. And she did manage to go back in time and I mean, with the research and found out what uh, his uh, parents' names were right before that. But of course, your uh, research gets more difficult because uh, 19th century records of the, of the Orthodox Church are written in the old Cyrillic, as you already know, and this, is, this makes it a bit more complicated. Aș fi bucurat dacă și Judy, pe care a fost prima despre care Judy Sarapolean Fisher, dacă ar fi, aș fi văzut-o acum în grupul respectiv, dar probabil din cauza pandemiei. So I would have, it would have, would have made me very happy to see this uh, Judy Sarapolean Fisher, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. There with you yeah. in the room. Well, I'm, I'm sorry she didn't make it there. He couldn't make it because her granddaughter was sick today, but otherwise they play here. Yeah. 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 Sarah, Sarah, right. We but are. maybe we can we can plan we'll have to plan another family reunion on somehow. We'll work on it. Alexander can help us figure out a way sometime. I, I definitely uh, we will. will. <laughs> we would like to hear these stories and um, there you have business cards if people want to contact Romanian Genealogy Society by email or on Facebook. Yeah. Sorry, what, what, the, what was the question? Oh, if anybody wants to contact? Yes, you have business cards. If, I, if people do, want to contact us and tell us, share the story. Oh, yeah, please. I will, I will share yeah. them. Yeah, 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 thank you. Just give me a second.
Da, am spus, cu siguranță poate ar fi o idee bună să mai planificăm astfel de întâlniri, pentru că sunt multe povești și ar fi frumos să le putem împărtăși cu mai multă lume care să fie prezentă pe partea cealaltă. Iar dacă dintre dumneavoastră există doritori să contacteze Societatea Română de Genealogie din Statele Unite, înainte să ne despărțim, eu voi lăsa pe, pe masă câteva dintre cărțile de vizită. Aveți adresa de mail care va ajunge într-un final dacă știți că e pentru Vicky. La să aici, dacă nu sunt suficiente, eventual o să țin eu una și o să puteți să faceți fotografii la, la datele de contact. Am dorit să adaug o chestiune foarte importantă. Vreau să vă spun că în cursul acestui film, în una din pozele care a fost acolo la comandare, ați putut să o vedeți și pe doamna Doina Izan. În acest film, pentru că familia ei, schimbând poze între ei în anii 60, una din poze de la comandarea bunicii, a ajuns acolo și ei, când au făcut filmul, și-au dat postele care le-au ajuns din România. Iar doamna Doina Iezan a vizionat acest film împreună cu fiul ei, el într-o seară, doar ei doi, și a țipat când s-a văzut în acest film. A fost extrem de surprins să se vadă acolo, în preț de câteva secunde în acest film. Adriana was sharing the story about how Mrs. Yazan found herself uh, in the uh, in the movie and uh, how she was she was very excited in the picture with the funeral that she identified herself and this is because of course uh, people in the uh, in the United States community that so to say shared the pictures with you the pictures that had been sent from all over from Romania all the way from Romania. And Mrs. Yazan would like to add something? No, aș vrea să transmiteți rudelor noastre că oricând sunt bineveniți, așteptați și doriți să vină să-i cunoaștem și personal. And uh, Mrs. Yazan would like to uh, ask you to please share this with their relatives, with everybody's relatives, I think, uh, that whenever they want to come over, they will be are welcomed and people want to have them and meet them and have the families reunite. So please make sure and this message uh, reaches out to them. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much. How wonderful. Cu siguranță și vă mulțumește mult pentru pentru mesaj. Mulțumesc și eu de Mrs. Ian would like to thank you too. All right. Mai avem intervenții? Așa? From Mr. Mândran. Okay. Familia Căpăți, care a ajuns din Beba Veche, a ajuns în Statele Unite și au fost returnați toată familia. Știe că Vicky mi-a trimis materialul. Așa. Da, și aș vrea să-i mulțumesc pentru chestia asta. Pentru materialul pe care le-a trimis pentru familia Căpăți. Da, pentru care e familia Căpăți, pentru că este străbunicul meu și bunicul de mare, de mine materne. Okay, so Mr. Mindran would like to, to thank you for uh, having shared with him the material you found on the Kaputz family who were, went all the way to the United States but then they were shipped back. And uh, yeah. this is important information for him on his maternal side of the family. Mm -hmm. okay. He shared that story with us in the coffee shop with you that time we were there. Yeah, we were there, right? Remember? Yes, yes. Povestea asta ne-a sunt atunci în 2016 când eram în cafenea aici. Exactly, exactly. That's right, that's right. And again, thank you very much, Vicky. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right. Very nice to see you again. Se bucură de asemenea să vă revadă. All right. So I think uh, this is it from us um, in the old country. <laughs> uh, I think uh, unless uh, the people in the room over there in, uh, would like to say anything or ask us anything, or uh, then I think this would be. We it. have any questions? No Anybody want to say anything in Romania? Va you be in petos? Is that? Can you hear me? Va you be in petos? And they said we love you too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. It was very, very. I, I cannot mention this. It's, it's been lovely seeing you again, and uh, hopefully we can make this happen as soon as possible. Maybe as early as September, but we'll talk about that soon. <laughs> yes, to be, continued. to be continued. Thank you so much. We are, we really appreciate it. It's very exciting for us, and we're just very thankful to be involved in this. Thanks. Okay. Încă o dată vă mulțumesc. Este, 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 sunt foarte emoționat și uh, că au fost implicați în tot acest demers. Iar din partea mea am spus că, de asemenea, mă foarte, mă foarte bucur să, le, să îi revăd pe câțiva dintre ei pe care îi cunosc. 
și că în speranța că putem să repetăm această, fie această manifestare sau o întâlnire cât de curând posibil, urmează, nu vă spunem încă ce și cum și când. Bun. Ne facem cu mâna, yes, ne aplaudăm. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. La revedere. La revedere. La revedere. Și gata. Okay. <laughs> a făcut pe toate. Vă mulțumim. <laughs> o să, până vă ridicați, am zis că o las câteva cărți de vizită aici. Dacă dorește cineva, fie să ia cu mine sau cu doamnele, pentru arbor de familie, pentru vizite, pentru că nu puteți comunica, pentru că vreți să cercetați, puteți o legătura cu noi, puneți câteva cărți de vizită, cine dorește le ia, cine nu, aici le lasă.